Okay, so what I'd like to do um, is look at the end of chapter three. Uh, and it's from page uh, 43 to 45 in the Road to Wigan Pier. And I'd like us to focus on, again, the, um, the comments that Orwell is making. In the same as in the first two chapters, uh, where we get the, the, the bulk of the chapter is descriptive. And then at the end of the chapter, Orwell moves into a commentary on what he's described. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, Orwell's comment on the status of the poor working class, um, what he calls the inherent sort of petty business of the of working class day to day life. And then he makes comparisons um, both in the, 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 the day to day life of the working class versus the middle class bourgeoisie and also the um, why, why it is that the um, bourgeoisie uh, seem to have this sort of ability to lead whereas the, um, the the working class seem to have much less of an ability um, to, to be to be natural, I suppose, natural leaders. So um, it starts from in Wigan, I stayed for a while. In Wigan, I stayed for a while with a miner who was suffering from nystig nystagmus. He could see across the room, but not much further. He had been drawing a compensation of 29 shillings a week for the past nine months. But the colliery company were now talking of putting him on partial compensation of 14 shillings a week. It all depended on whether the doctor passed him as fit for, for light work on top. Even if the doctor did pass him, there would, needless to say, be no light work available, but he could draw the dole and the company would have saved itself 15 shillings a week. So notice from, right from the very start here, uh, Orwell's use of inverted commas. And he does this a lot. And this is the voice of those in authority. This is not Orwell speaking. This is the language, the vocabulary of authority. That they they couch the, fa the fact that essentially he's, this man is going to be losing 15 shillings a week um, in, in language which seems to soften it by calling it partial compensation. And there's an ironic undertone, you know, it's, it's when, when Orwell does this, when Orwell uses inverted commas in this way, there is absolutely a sense of irony that he's sort of almost, you know, like people do air quotes um, in that slightly ironic way. What it does here, what this first part, part, part of this passage does is it really highlights the games, the charade, I suppose that the authority plays with the working class because essentially what they're doing is they're robbing this man of 15 shillings but they're doing it in a way that makes it seem like they're doing him a favour and it's these games that, that um, the authorities, the corporations, the coal companies, those in authority play with the working classes that Orwell seems, to be, seems so appalled by uh, and again, it's this, it's this, these sorts of phrases here. Needless to say, there would be no light work available, uh, so the company would have saved itself 15 shillings a week. So really, the whole process is inevitable. Mm -hmm, can't spell. Hang on, let's try again. Get that out. The whole process is inevitable. That they're caught in a game, in a charade. This word here. This inevitable game that they're caught in, where everybody knows what's happening, no one actually says anything about it, and yet these people are, are robbing men like this chap, um, who clearly has this um, problem with his sight because of the work he's done. This is due to the mining, so due to the to, to the work that he has done over his life, he has lost his sight or is losing his sight, and yet the corporation, the coal companies, the mine mining companies. Um, are playing games with him um, so that um, they can save themselves some money. Um, and then it moves on um, and he talks about, again, what, what he always does, what Orwell always does, and we've seen this before, it's this first-person experience, first-hand first -hand, um, uh, witnessing of the, these people's lives. 
You know, he's not reading about it, he's seeing it, he's watching the man go. And there's that point that he keeps doing that he's had, you know, it makes him realise. So from the first hand experience, Orwell has a realisation um, of this that we see time and again, the differences between the working class um, and the bourgeoisie. And in this main, the main, um, the key word in this screencast here is this word here, status, because it's status that he keeps referring to, the idea of the working class versus the bourgeoisie, the middle class, and what that means, what status actually means, um, and I think what he's saying, what he he says, status seems to equal. A certain level of rights and a level of expectations that we're, if we're born into a certain class we have a certain expectation that we're going to have um, uh, certain rights afforded to us so this is what he says down here here was a man who had been half blinded in one of the most useful of all jobs and was drawing a pension to which he had the perfect right if anybody has a right to anything. Yet he could not, so to speak, demand this pension. He could not, for instance, draw it when and how he wanted it. He had to go to the colliery once a week at a time named by the company, and when he got there he was kept waiting about for hours in the cold wind. For all I know, he was also expected to touch his cap and show gratitude to whoever paid him. At any rate, he had to waste an afternoon and spend sixpence uh, in bus fares. So it seems that this idea of status here seems to underpin everything. It underpins the interactions between people. It underpins the processes they have to go through. That everything is determined by status. So this miner has served his country in many ways. He's done the most useful of all jobs. And yet he doesn't have the right to demand a pension. He cannot demand it. He has to wait. And he has to take the pension in the terms of those in authority. So again, these are big, bold claims, but very profound claims that George Orwell is making here that these men, because of their status as working class individuals, have no right to demand anything. And they even have to, you know, as for all, uh, all one knows, the, the, this, this idea of touching the cap, that's a, um, the, the doffing the cap and the dipping of the head, is, is a sort of a symbol of subservience. That to do that shows that this man should be pathetically grateful for what he has a right to. At any rate, and then he says he has to waste an afternoon and spend sixpence in bus fares. And what Orwell then does is he moves into this idea of um, of, of, of rights of the bourgeoisie and then and then of time itself and the, the, what time means when you when you are poor and when you're working class. So what he does now is he goes on in the in, in, in the passage and he has a comparison here with himself. So he compares with his own life with his own middle class status. His own status as a member of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the ruling class. This is a Mar this is a Marxist term. The the word the word bourgeoisie is a term that comes from Mar from, from Marxist theory. So the bourgeoisie being the ruling class. Even a down at heel member, I mean, he calls himself is it lower middle upper class or something like that? upper middle lower class he's he's he really doesn't consider himself to be much above in terms of certainly financially in terms of his own sense of status not much above those of the working class but there is a natural right and i think this is what one of the the, the principles of marxism it's is it seems that there's a and it's not natural but what authority does is say that there's a natural or, or natural right for the ruling classes to have certain um, expectations and certain rights. 
and this word natural here is 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 something which seems to be inculcated to be bred into the people both the working classes um, and the, um, the, the the ruling classes this idea of inculcation or breeding so all the classes seem to have inculcated within them um, a sense of their own natural status and he says here I don't earn much more than a minor rent it's not about money here but it's about this natural status and then the natural status doesn't necessarily link to money and he can have the, he can draw out money in a gentle money, money manner when he chooses he has choice okay so that the that the the ruling classes one of the things that the ruling classes have is choice and that's something that the working classes don't have and then he moves on in this in this slightly longer and, and probably the most important passage in this particular section because what he's talking about here is how the working class life is full of petty inconveniences and indignity. This is the working class life. Of being kept waiting by who? By those in power. By the ruling classes having to do everything at other people's convenience that again is the ruling classes and it's inherent in working class life and this is the word I think here which links into the one I've just mentioned the idea of it being bred um, that they don't question it okay it's not that they're going hang on a minute what why is this why is Um, why is this happening? Why, why are we why are we having to be kept waiting around? They don't they don't question it because it's just bred into them, and these and and it's these it's these influences here. Which link into that, these thousand this thousand influences and these are the influences that are created by the ruling classes. So created there by the ruling classes, and they're pressing the working man down into a passive role. And there's another word there which links into Marxist theory. Um, the idea um, that the, 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 the machinery, what they call the machinery of oppression, the, um, the, the, the stuff that happens, the laws, the, the processes, the expectations um, that press these people down in, into passivity because if they're passive they're not going to rebel so this this the this idea of stop stopping rebellion that stopping questioning and stopping rebellion is the key to to ruling uh, the lower classes and then he goes on to talk about this idea of he and the he here this he is the working class man feels himself the slave of mysterious authority it's an interesting word to use there because the slave is someone with no rights you know the slave has no rights at all so he's, has, he's a slave to a mysterious authority and has a firm conviction that they will never allow him to do this that and the other um, so who are they again it's the ruling classes but what's interesting here is it's uh, that it's mysterious and unknown that the authority itself is not knowable this links into um, Orwell's two most famous novels um, Animal Farm which many of you will know and some of you have also read 1984 because in Animal Farm Napoleon the pig uh, withdraws himself from day-to-day -day life and um, at one stage there's a quote later on the, no the novel where he's rarely seen outside of the farmhouse and in 1984 we have Big Brother and Big Brother is this name faceless unknown authority and of course, if you can't see it, you can't rebel. You can't fight what you can't see. So, so this idea of this mysterious sort of omnipotent authority, this godlike, omnipotent means all-powerful. That this all-powerful authority um, is something that, that can't be seen. And so, of course, if you can't see it, you can't rebel against it. And then in this final um, part, again, as he always does, 
we've seen this time and again with Orwell. Um, you know, there is a certain sense of repetition in these screencasts, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's important that we see that Orwell has a certain structure to this book where he will spend the majority of each chapter describing what he sees. And then at the end of each chapter, he sort of takes a step backwards and reflects and comments on what he sees. And this is this final part. I've, I've missed a little bit out here at a particular instance, just because I think it's the, the, the final sentence is, is important and it links really nicely into, into what goes before. And he says, a person of bourgeois origin goes through life with some expectation of getting what he wants within reasonable limits. Hence the fact that in times of stress, educated people tend to come to the front. They are no more gifted than the others and their education is generally quite useless in itself. But they're accustomed to a certain amount of deference and consequently have the cheek necessary to a commander. They will come to the front. That they will come to the front seems to be taken for granted, always and everywhere. And then he says at the end, I do agree that in almost any revolt, rebellion, um, revolution, the leaders would tend to be the people who could pronounce their H's. So this, this, this word here, expectation, that I talked about right at the beginning, that we expect, you know, that, that, that the expectations are linked to class and that they're not questioned. You know, that these, 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 um, these rights are, are something that we just expect. And, and I think the word is expectation. We expect it to happen. We're not going to question an expectation. Um, and then he talks about this, this interesting, uh, he sort of develops this argument of the idea of leadership here at the end. That, that lead, the leaders tend to be the educated people, not necessarily because they have more knowledge of the thing that needs to be led on, but they're accustomed to a certain amount of deference. Deference means a um, um, certain amount of um, uh, status and authority. You know, we expect, you know, I might as expect as a teacher, uh, particularly with younger students, a certain amount of deference. I'd expect um, the younger students to call me sir or Mr. Coxon. You know, I, I wouldn't expect them to say, yo, Darren, how's it hanging? That kind of Not that anyone ever speaks like that anymore. Um, no one ever says that. Probably, I don't think anyone's said that probably since about 1996. Um, but you know what I mean, that that that. For, 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 for myself and for people who are in a certain position of, of status, they expect a certain level of deference. And if they don't get it, um, then then it's it's it seems odd. And then this this idea here, of the, the cheek and that and that cheek is the confidence. So it's the confidence that comes from authority that gives them the, 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 the nest, gives them the, 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 the confidence in order to lead. And it seems to be taken for granted that this confidence, this leadership seems to be taken for granted. And I think that is because it's just in the order of things. OK, that it's just in the order of things in this country that those who are in uh, who, who are in the middle classes and above in the bourgeoisie are the leaders. Full stop. You don't you don't question it. It just is because it always has been. And he says always and everywhere. So it's it's you know, it's for all time. It's an eternal thing. And then at the end here, he uses this this um, this symbol here, the symbol of the H's. Um, it's symbolic of the ruling classes. That and it's it's this sort of snobbish attitude um, that th they have towards the working class. That the working class don't pronounce their H's. You know, look at my house rather than look at my house. Um, so we've so this and you'll you'll see this later in the book. He talks about the um the the the, the bourgeoisie attitude towards the working class. <clears throat> so just in summary, then, what have we learned? Well, what we've learned here is that the working classes are trapped, and they're trapped within a system which has a certain machinery attached to it. And this machinery keeps them passive. And, and seemingly grateful for what they get. However pathetic it is. And the working, the ruling class do this by changing the rules. The, the ruling classes, they change the rules. They keep the poor waiting. 
and they deny them the chance, the opportunity of rebelling against anyone because the ruling classes themselves are faceless. And that this, this, we've got this sort of name, the nameless, faceless corporation that seems to be something that is of a real interest to Orwell. 